Hi, welcome to The Witch in the Woods and today I'm going to talk about walk cunning and trolldom. Now I've seen a few videos on the internet that talk about walk cunning and um, from what I've seen they are basic herbalism information um, and there's nothing wrong with basic herbal information, you do need to know what you're picking and why you're picking it. Um, but I wanted to do something that was a little bit different and that is exploring the traditional uses and um, some of the traditional knowledge of herb charming and wood cunning and trolldom. The history of using herbs for medicine goes back into the far distant past. Although we cannot know how herbs were used, the earliest evidence of their use possibly dates back 60,000 years. Species of flowering plants were found in the grave of a Neanderthal man found in Iraq. Eight species were found, seven of which are still found in the area today and are still used for medicine. It is thought that these medicinal and sacred herbs were scattered to strengthen his journey into the next world. Herbs are depicted in the ancient cave paintings in France, dating from 25,000 to 13,000 BC. And herbs are recorded on Mesopotamian clay tablets. 5,000 years ago. They were also recorded in Egypt and in India. This plant knowledge was undoubtedly gained from trial and error and passed on orally from generation to generation. Eventually this knowledge began to be recorded. The earliest recorded lists we know of were made by a Chinese herbalist called Shen Nung, who listed 366 plants and their use as drugs in 2800 BC. In the 4th century BC, Hippocrates wrote, let food be thy medicine, and he also listed over 400 herbs. Materia Medica was compiled in the 1st century AD by Dioscorides, which was a definitive work upon which many later works were based. This Greek physician was called the father of pharmacology, and this work was widely circulated during the medieval era and added to with further Arabic and Indian sources. In ancient Greece, physicians often sought the help of rizotomoki, or root gatherers, who foraged from the wild, but later these herbs began to be grown in herb gardens, often in monasteries. The earliest herb garden in Britain appeared in the 7th century, and was probably derived from a Roman sign. Herb use and herb gathering then has been an intrinsic part of hominid survival until only very recently with the arrival of allopathic pharmaceuticals. So the term wart coming comes from the Anglo-Saxon of course and the term wart means a herb or a plant or some, something that was used generally in everyday lives, any kind of plant. And the word cunning meant some skill or some cleverness in using them. And what cunning applied to many different procedures, sort of making salves or making um, potions and remedies. It also applied to things like beer making. Now, we often see herbs in a chemical component way but to the Anglo-Saxons and to our predecessors herbs were actually seen as magical and spiritual beings. So in Anglo-Saxon England charms and cures were invoked to aid the healing process 
And the only difference between our herbalism of today and Anglo-Saxon wall cunning would seem to be that the herbs were not only picked and used, but they were actually spoken to. They were addressed and asked for their help as if they were sentient beings. This idea of herbs as magical beings may actually come from a long history of plants being used for psychedelic use. And when a plant can create this effect upon a person, it is not unusual to see it as some sentient and powerful otherworldly being. And so perhaps the use of plants as psychedelics led to a lot of plant worship in ancient times and a lot of reverence um, for their magical and powerful and wise um, properties. So this is my take on it. This is why I think plants have been so revered throughout cultures and throughout history. Of course, psychedelics these days are illegal. Um, and that's probably to stop people doing stupid things like driving while they're high. But in a long usage throughout history, they had a sacred purpose and a sacred place in society. Now, I don't think they were used willy-nilly. I think they had a time and a place to take them. And certain people would take them. Now, these can be traced to the Volvers and the Sadia workers. And we know this because in the graves of Volvers we have found psychedelic drugs. And we don't know what they were used for, but the fact that they were psychedelic drugs may indicate to us that they were a role in the work of the Volva. So there is the burial of the Volva in um, Frikat. And she was buried with a purse um, which had henbane seeds in it. Now, henbane was used quite a lot in the medieval era to make the witches' flying potions. They also found cannabis seeds in burials as well. And it would seem that the vulva who was renowned to go into a trance and to be able to speak with the spirits of the other world perhaps used these psychedelic drugs to initiate this state of frenzy, of visionary perception and of otherworldly knowledge. Now many of these plants can be deadly and so it could be that the power of the vulva came through the power of this woman to pass through the gates of death and actually speak to the beings, the ancestors, the ghosts and maybe even the gods on the other side and to retrieve sacred wisdom from the ancestors. Eventually, these secrets of herb knowledge and herb working were passed on to the Anglo-Saxons, who were an early Christian culture. But they retained a lot of the magic of their forebears um, and simply replaced pagan and heathen practices with Christian ritual and with Christian worship of Jesus and the saints. So the gods were replaced by the spirit of Christ and the angels and the saints, but the magical aid of the gods was still sought in the same way as it had been previously. So the Leech Book was an early medieval manuscript of Anglo-Saxon cures, and although it lists practical herbs and practical herb use in many of the recipes, it was not afraid to use superstition and strange sympathetic magic and rituals to invoke a healing and to work its charms. And it would also uh, counteract bizarre supernatural forces that were thought to cause illness and also invoke other supernatural uh, causes such as the saints and such as the name of Jesus, um, that would actually help to cure. So much of our modern medicine today is an antithesis, really, to this early superstition and what we consider dark age practices. Um, we look at it with scorn and derision in our modern society 
and many of us feel that we don't want to return to the ages of superstition and ignorance. Well, but you must remember that much of our medicine today is based on the very knowledge that these medicine people evolved and in fact our modern medicines don't come without problems they can also be seen in ways of having ignorance and um, dangerous practices and many medicines can actually cause harm and um, some medicines have dreadful side effects so if we look at our own medicine as the height of sophistication we must remember that it does not come without its own problems. Now I'm not knocking modern medicine. If you need some help then definitely approach a doctor, ask for those medicines that can cure you. But be aware of any side effects they may be causing. And also in my own experience I have gone to doctors and asked for help about certain little things, not major illnesses I must say, and the doctors have been unable to help whereas I have found herbal information and it has done exactly what people throughout the ages have said it will do. So as an alternative herbal medicine is a great thing to fall back on. But here we're talking about using herbs in charms and in spells and for their magical significance. And in my opinion, if we want to do this, it's a good idea to have some idea of how the ancients actually used these herbs in magical practices. Now today, we have long lists that you can find on Pinterest and you can find on Instagram of a herb and its magical use and while there's nothing wrong with this I don't think a herb that you may use as a say a simple shaker jar spell will have as much power as a practice and a ritual that has been passed down through generations um, to invoke certain sympathetic magic associations so I think we have also a limited knowledge of magical herb use um, and it comes through almost too much information. It comes through um, thinking we know what it's all about without actually referring to ages past and our ancestors and how things were ritually used in the past. So I'm not saying there's no power in it. I just think that if we apply certain rules and certain regulations to the work we do that we have a much more powerful effect on our spell work. Practices tend to build up power through repetition and so when something has been worked over and over and over again it's like the path has already been trodden, the energy is already there to um, enhance any work that we are doing whereas if we invent some kind of simple um, shake a jar spell or spell pouch but don't really engage with that act um, oh, um, with, with sort of the reverence that our ancestors would have done the chances are that the results will not be as powerful so what sources do we have um, when referring back to what our ancestors and what previous generations may have done. Well, we have certain charms that have been recorded um, in the Anglo-Saxon sources, in the Scandinavian sources, and although I've not really researched them in Italian sources and other European sources too, um, we know from the Nine Herbs charm that Mugwort is called the Mother of Herbs. In this charm, Mugwort is addressed directly the practitioner of this charm is actually speaking to the herb to invoke some kind of connection and conversation between the user and the herb itself. So the herb is addressed, remember mugwort, what you achieved, remember plantain, um, remember, and the herbs are actually spoken to as if they are sentient, as if you are asking a 
a supernatural being to aid you. Now, in this charm, Mokwal is called the Mother of Herbs, and it was a very important healing herb to the Anglo-Saxons. I think it was considered one of the primary healing herbs themselves. It was said to grow by the door of healers, and it is great for lucid dreaming and psychic work. Now, my take on this, calling Mugwort the Mother of Herbs, is that Mugwort is in fact connected to the goddess herself. She is connected to the earth, to Gaia, and to the universe. And so the presence of Mugwort, and not only the use of Mugwort, but also the presence of Mugwort around you, is a great aid in connecting to the earth, to the land, and to the wider universal cosmos, the realm of psychic awareness, the realm of dreams. She is a powerfully protective and maternal herb. Um, and of course we can only assume this if we assume that the herb itself is a sentient being. Mm -hmm. this in mind, many of the old Anglo-Saxon charms have conditions upon which a herb is picked, such as incantations must be said over them, or they must be picked in certain ways or at certain times. Now it would seem that the best time to work and work with herbs and work with magic and also pick some of these herbs was the night time hours. So many of the charms say things like after the sun has gone down or in the dead of night or before the sun rises and it would seem that not many of them want you to do a work in daylight so the best time to work with these herbs would be when the sun is not in the sky um, and possibly when the lunar powers are quite um, beneficial to the work. So a charm against elf disease recites that the work must take place after sundown on a Thursday evening. Now Thursday was considered a very beneficial day to do any magical working and the reason for this is that the assembly or the thing was held on a Thursday and this was an assembly to pass judgment and law and for grievances to be aired amongst the tribe and to be listened to by the Lord or by the chieftain and he would sit on a barrow mound and consult the ancestors about what the right decision for this uh, dispute would be. And these took place on a Thursday and it was thought that because of the thing taking place on a Thursday this was the day when the ancestors and the dead were close by and close to the human world and able to be consulted and help on human matters. So many magical workings were considered most beneficial on a Thursday. Now later as Christianity arrived it became a Thursday and a Sunday um, for the very reason that Sunday in the Christian calendar was the sacred day. So um, any day that was considered sacred um, I suppose if you're Jewish of heritage, a Saturday would be considered a sacred day. But in the heathen world, the best day for doing any troll working, any um, 
Walkening would be a Thursday evening. So the work must be done in deadly seriousness and deadly silence. So there are many cautions in Trolldom and in Anglo-Saxon charms against speaking in any way or to anybody when on your way to gather herbs or to perform some kind of ritual act. It was also said that it would taint the work, it would ruin the work if you were to laugh or to smile um, or to greet anybody. So you must ignore everybody, say nothing, not laugh, not smile and not be afraid. So you have to keep an even temperature, an even temperament throughout this whole work. So many charms say things such as you must not speak until such a time as you make an incantation over this herb. So you must go in silence and you must return in silence. So not until such times as incantations are made should you make a sound. And sometimes a herb is approached before it is picked. Um, such as a charm against an elf where you must go to a herb in silence you are asked to sing a litany the Benedictine and the Paternoster over it and then stick a knife blade into the roots of the herb go away and come back the next day before you pick it and carry it away and then there are other such rituals as you must place it under an altar, sing more incantations and then not work with it until the next day again, so that's three days later. Um, obviously the singing of Christian chants is the aid of a divinity that probably went back even further into a heathen past where um, other spirits of nature were approached. Now I don't think that in the previous heathen rituals it was so much a god that was approached as spirits of the land, spirits of the ancestors, um, lesser spirits, more earthly spirits. It's very rare that gods were invoked, it's more humble spirits that were reached out to to ask for their help. The repetition of charms often comes with the magical number of nine, um, such as saying things nine times. Also three and nines, um, very magical numbers. So you'll find recipes where there are three of this and three of that quite often. So the repetition and the numbering of doing a certain ritual act was very important in this magical working. So herbs must also be picked in certain ways. Um, celandine must be picked with the two hands turned upright. Mulberries should be picked with the thumb and the ring finger of the left hand. Certain herbs should be walked around three times before they are picked. Water was also considered a very magical ingredient in these herbs and potions and in spell work in general. So in the Anglo-Saxon world water elves were considered more benign to mankind than many other nature spirits and water worship was prevalent throughout all of um, pagan Europe and we can see this today even in Derbyshire um, where wells are dressed with flower petals um, and this takes place even now in some certain Derbyshire villages um, in early summer and so this is a remnant of early well water and spring water worship. In Trolldom it's said that water should be taken with the current, not against the stream but with the flow of a stream and a stream that flowed north was particularly sacred so there were also sacred places that had more power that would imbue a spell with more trolldom. So in these Anglo-Saxon charms we find that 
speaking and blowing is a very magical practice and I've said more about this in um, several other videos. There was one on Anglo-Saxon charms and witchcraft which I might link there or there and uh, also Norse magic and heathenism, I can't remember the name of it. Um, but anyway, you would breathe into a patient, very often on the left hand side you would blow away illness and you would breathe onto the herb and speak onto the herb. And the very magical power of the breath would imbue each spell with extra power. Spit was also incredibly powerful and it would be used to spit into a potion or to spit away illness. Um, there's also the practice of spitting into beer, um, which was part of the sacred rites of beer making. So one Anglo-Saxon charm in the Leech book states um, that to cure a blotch on the skin, you should scarify the neck after the setting of the sun. Pour in silence the blood into running water and after that spit three times saying have thou this unheal and depart away with it. It then says go again on a clean way to the house and cleanliness was very important. You must be clean as well before you take these practices and it says go either way in silence yet again forbidding you to speak to dissipate the power when you do any such ritual act. So traditions and techniques of Anglo-Saxon medicine continued on in Britain through the practice of the cunning folk um, and these continued on to, well, clearly to the 17th century but possibly later. In Scandinavia this was called the art of trolldom. Both used similar techniques of using plants and herbal medicine combined with sympathetic magic and rituals to create a healing, to affect healing. In trolldom, cures were called bota, if I'm saying that right, and many were recorded very late even into the 19th century. Now if you're interested in this, there is the book of trolldom, which I'll grab. <clears throat> this book, The Book of Trolldom, by Johannes Bjorn Garbeck, back, um, which lists many, 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 many different trolldom cures. Um, <clears throat> so if you're interested in that at all, you could read um, the recorded manuscripts of what these troll cures were. It was considered that people who had the art of trolldom were born with these gifts, but they could be acquired by other certain means. So the gifts that could be acquired were things such as the art of having warm hands, which is another way of saying uh, being able to do physical healing by laying on of hands. Other things were clairvoyant and psychic abilities. Now there were certain activities that you could do to acquire these techniques and to acquire these skills. One of them would be hugging a tree in which a cuckoo sings. There was drinking of water in which a white snake had been boiled. There was removing a frog from the mouth of a snake and saving it from certain death or crawling under a coffin. Perhaps easier techniques than finding a white snake or saving a frog would be to participate in Utsita which was sitting out on a barrow mound or at graveyards in the dead of night um, and consulting the spirits of the ghosts, the dead and the ancestors. And it was considered that it was these spirits of the ancestors who taught the art of trolldom. Seldom were they appealing to gods 
but more often appealing to ghosts and to spirits. Um, you could also do the Arsgang, which was the yearly walk that would take place on Christmas Eve. And yet again, this was conducted in deadly silence. You should not speak to anyone. You should not laugh or smile. Um, and you should not be fearful of anything you meet. If any of these conditions were broken, you would break the magic of this practice. Now, if you practiced Arsgang for seven or nine years consecutively, you also gained extra special power and extra special gifts. So you could do it yearly for seven or nine years um, and you would gain the beneficial help of a particularly powerful spirit who would appear to you, a particularly powerful ghost. Apart from the spirits of the dead, Trolldom also placed extra special emphasis on working with the spirits of the land or as the Anglo-Saxons would call them, the elves and the dwarves. Now sometimes these spirits could cause illness, but some more benign spirits could help mankind with healing. So certain places of working were considered to have extra special power of trolldom, um, and these were places like crossroads and wells and springs, large earthbound rocks, ancient burial mounds, um, cemeteries, rivers that run north, where three roads meet, and also I was told, although it's not in this book of Trolldom, places where three rivers meet, and these have extra special power and connection to the other world. To diagnose an illness in a problem, it was traditional to conduct predictions and um, oracular divinations. So first you would delve into the art of spardom um, and by whatever means you could discern, this could be any means, it could be cards, tarot readings, pendulum, whichever means you like. But very often in Trollton it was scrying in alcohol or by stopper, 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 which was my batteries running dead, <laughs> or by stopper which was predicting through dropping melted lead, tin or wax into cold water or an egg into cold water and this is a practice that's still prevalent in Eastern Europe today. Um, and reading the signs that the, um, the material would make in the water and divining what the problem was. Sometimes a healing would include pouring this water away again. So this was conducted over the patient um, and around the patient's body. And then sometimes they would take away that cold water and the manner in which they disposed of it would be part of the healing. So of course many witches today still work with herbs and they will tell you ways of picking, storing and drying herbs and of course this is all very valuable information especially when it comes to picking herbs and identifying herbs, being sure that what you are picking is not a poisonous plant. Many plants look very similar, you want to make sure you know what you're picking and you do your research. Um, and that you pick wisely, don't take too much from the land. Um, they can also tell you about making salves and potions and tinctures and decoctions and infusions. And this is all very basic herbal techniques. Um, it's got its place and definitely something that you do need to research if you want to work with herbs. But also I think there's a value in talking about how our ancient ancestors would do ritual to pick those herbs, um, their magical formulas and their magical techniques. And by researching these two, this should now become part of our herbal medicine, I think, 
in this century. It's a respect for the plant, it's approaching the plant as if it is a sentient being um, and with ritual and magic and as, as they say without speaking with some kind of seriousness and um, without dissipating the power trivially. So um, I think that's it, I'll just check. Yeah, so timing and technique and ritual work I think is all part of herbalism too. So I hope you enjoyed that, if you did please give it a like, thank you for your likes and subscribes and um, if you've got any questions, if you've got anything to add about your own herbal work, maybe your own work with plant spirits, um, there's a lot to be said shamanically about working with plant spirits too which I've not even touched upon. Um, although it's got a, its place in this conversation. Um, so if you've got anything to comment, add that in the box below. And I hope to speak to you all again soon. Cheers for listening. Bye.